From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. Up first, the latest Beef Cattle Chat podcast from the Beef Cattle Institute. This time, the BCI's Brad White, Bob Larson, and Bob Weber discuss the challenges of bull buying with Dr. Dare Bullock from the University of Kentucky and Dr. Matt Spangler from the University of Nebraska, both professors in beef genetics. K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook looks at the state of the dairy industry and the challenges that producers could be facing over the next 12 to 18 months. Sarah Moyer has a preview of the family and friends reunion being held October 12th. And Randall Kowalik gets advice from K-State Associate Professor of Horticulture Cheryl Boyer about planting trees and shrubs in the home landscape this fall. It's all just ahead on Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans in more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. I'm Sarah Moyer, and it's time for Cattle Chat with the director of the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State, Brad White. He leads discussion this week on bull buying decisions. Brad? Hi, welcome to BCI Cattle Chat. I'm Brad White, and we've got a full house here today. I'm happy to have Bob Weber and Bob Larson, and and we've got a couple guests. We've got Dare Bullock, an extension professor from the University of Kentucky, and Matt Spangler, a professor at University of Nebraska Lincoln in beef genetics and an extension specialist. So we're happy to have these guys here today. Morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So we'll we'll jump in, and today we're going to have a, a couple different topics. But first, if you have any questions or ever want to send us any topics that you want to talk about, send us an email at bci at ksu edu, or you can follow us on on Twitter. One of the things that we're going to look at is bull buying. How do you decide which bulls to buy and when? Dare and Matt, I'd like for you guys to have just a minute to introduce yourselves, and then we're going to jump into the bull buying. So, so Dare, you want to tell us a little bit about you? Dare Bullock. I'm from the University of Kentucky. I'm an extension specialist there. I grew up in Florida on a cow, calf, and watermelon operation, and I've uh, been in Kentucky now about 25 years. And Matt Spangler, I'm a faculty member at the University of Nebraska. I actually have a three-way appointment, uh, research, extension, and teaching. Uh, I've been there about uh, 10 years, predominantly working in the area of beef cattle genetics, actually a Kansas native, received an undergraduate degree in animal science from right here in Manhattan, Kansas. Great. Well, we're, we're happy to have you guys with us here today. Cause, and, and because of that, we wanted to have some of these discussions. And, and one of the questions that we get relatively frequently is, we're buying a bull. How do I pick the right one? And it seems that the increase in the amount of information has certainly made our bull catalogs thicker, but not easier to digest because there's lots of different things to go in there. And, and one of the things that we had as lead in before was I see a bull and I think maybe he's the best bull for me. How do I figure that out? How do I decide? Can I pay that much for him as he as he goes in value and at the auction? So Dare. What are your thoughts on, on bull buying in general and maybe some specific things we'd look for? Well, I, I think that we really do have a lot of tools available to us, more than we've ever had. And, and so uh, anytime somebody opens up a catalog for any particular bull, you might see 20, 25 pieces of information on a bull. I think the key that all three of us would say is, first of all, is just narrow it down. There's a lot of pieces of information that aren't really valuable to you. Eliminate those right away and, and don't pay attention to them. Try and focus on the traits uh, and the best tool within that trait to make a decision on. I, I mean, I think most of us would argue that that's expected progeny differences for most of those production traits we deal with. And so focus in on the three, four, maybe five that impact your operation, your marketing, your management, and concentrate there and, and go with it. Now, the value side gets a lot tougher then you have to start considering, well, how many females am I going to breed with this bull? Am I going to retain ownership and have more value coming back in? There's a lot of factors that go into that actual value part that 
is once again a personal decision for a particular management operation. So let's say let's say I'm a, a commercial cow calf producer and I'm going to buy a bull. And as you said, there's lots of information. So a lot of times we may have his actual characteristics of that bull, his growth. We may have EPDs. We may have ultrasound results. We may even have the results of some genetic testing. Right. And sometimes those those pieces of information, it's hard to absorb. So you're saying kind of narrow that field. So if I'm a commercial guy, are there a handful of things I should focus on out of the gate, even in those broad categories of types of information? Right. Yeah, I, absolutely. I think that for any trait that we have an EPD on, we would argue that that's the selection tool to use, and, and it alone. I mean, a lot of times, particularly you think about something like calving ease, trying to find a bull to breed to some heifers. Uh, we would argue that calving ease direct alone is the best tool for making that selection decision for that trait. I mean, we've got to look at it. It's, it's a multi-trait deal that we're looking at. But, you know, it, it's, it's human nature to then peek over at what that, that bull's actual birth weight was and, and, and let that influence your decision. When you start bringing in those outside factors, it, it really clouds the picture rather than clearing it. So we would argue that calving ease direct a, alone. You brought up the genomics information. We are fortunate now that that information gets incorporated into the EPD, so you don't have to look at it separate. It's already in there. So if I look at the EPD, that, that has it in there. Matt, I'll turn to you. What As you're picking that bull and you're, you're talking to commercial guys and he says, and we just talked about the example of a heifer bull, let's say I'm picking one for my cows, and I'm selling calves at weaning, are there a couple things you, you want me to look at or, or in broad terms as I evaluate bull buying? Yeah, I, I think if the bull's going to be mated to mature cows, uh, the other question we have to ask is, are we retaining replacement heifers, yes or no? If the answer to that is no and we're marketing all calves at weaning, then obviously uh, we want to try to increase weaning weight. That's our, our point of, of revenue. But we can't forget about carcass traits as well because somebody's buying those calves and we want them to come back and buy them the next year, so there has to be value transferred even when we sell them at weaning. If we retain replacement heifers as well, uh, then all of a sudden it becomes more complex. We've got to think about the lactation potential, so milk EPD of those uh, replacement females, their mature size, uh, reproductive longevity. So the list becomes longer as we try to increase the number of things we're trying to do with the same bull. And do we, do we give up a lot... How much do we give up when I say I want to try to produce the best steer and keep replacement heifers versus saying, I'm just going to sell everything and find another source for my replacement heifers? Because sometimes I feel like, well, we've got all these selection tools. Maybe I can better balance and I can get the best steers and heifers. Thoughts? I, I, yeah, I think that's a good question. And, and common practice would be try to do everything. Right. Keep back your own replacement heifers, also market calves. The reality is as we have more objectives, more things we're trying to do, inherently we make less progress in any, any one of them. Just think about a to-do list that has 20 items on it. We're going to move all those a lot, lot slower to completion than if we just had one thing to, on the to-do list when we woke up in the morning. So I should scratch off most of my to-do list. That's what I just heard right there. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think Matt's right. There's there's a, a real challenge in putting too many things on the list, and we should think about the challenge, too, of some of the traits we want to drive towards maybe some kind of maximal potential, like terminal selection for increased weaning weight, probably not a lot of consequence to us in the system. But when we think about the replacement female decision, Matt mentioned mature weight and lactation. Those are optimization sort of exercises, and maximum of those things represents dramatically increased cost. So we've got to control, use the genetic tools to control those to fit our environment. So it does become a lot more complicated. Uh, I think one strategy that particularly kind of medium and large size breeders need to start thinking about is how do I actually now, instead of having one common objective that spans all pieces of the selection decision, be more tactical and separate those and say, okay, we're going to buy a couple of bulls and we're going to turn with a select group of cows to build replacement heifers out of that really build the best replacement females. And so those bulls are selected under a different criteria than the bulls that are going with the remainder of the cow herd that are maybe a terminal selection decision. And that simplifies things a lot. But just that, takes separating. A, that takes a pretty large herd, wouldn't you say? 
Well, you know, really, if, if you've got the opportunity to have at least two, two breeding, breeding pastures, well, is uh, then, and, and then you, you know, that means a, a herd of maybe 50 cows that you could, you know, segregate in, in, into two different uh, breeding objectives. Um, so it, it's it's pretty practical, even for relatively, relatively. small producers. But, but what I'm hearing, one of, one of the things that's, that's kind of a theme is we have forever said, don't single trait select, don't single trait select. However, there should be some focus in an area and you're picking out some things that are important to you because you also you just can't have the best of everything yeah it just doesn't work that way yeah the other thing that, that and I'm, I'm thinking a, a little out loud here that you know we've, we've got some technology that lets us sort of retrospectively sort out the, the breeding stuff so you know even a producer that's got us oh, is required to have one single mob of cows if you turned out two different bulls that were selecting their two different breeding objectives we can go back and figure out which heifer calves are out of which one of those bulls with just a simple DNA parentage test and then use the, that information to select replacement females. Because we know that bull selection over time accounts for, you know, three generations of bulls is nearly 88% of the gene flow in the herd. Um, and so a, a simple application of a DNA tool that's relatively inexpensive kind of helps you surmount that hurdle uh, in terms What's your, of selection. One of the things I guess I'm hearing you say is there are some technology tools that the identification of the sire in a commercial setting that was really challenging, well, a few years ago. But maybe we're not using those tools as well as we could be in the commercial side, that there is a place for that, not just in the purebred world, but also in the, in the commercial side. And I think, and I think that's as we, as we pick bulls, we'll be able to incorporate some of those tools. And, it, and it's still, it comes back to doing your homework and having a plan that you know what direction you want your herd to be. And that, that can't be everything to everybody. So I think having that plan is, is what you guys are saying. And great discussion on, on figuring out bulls. And as we, as we walk through that process, we think about buying bulls. What are some of our different decision points? And it's not about the amount of information on the bulls. It's about filtering that information and deciding how that best applies to your operation. Have a great week. Thanks, Brad. That was the director of the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University, Brad White with Cattle Chat. If those discussions about bull buying decisions left you with any questions, please visit ksubci.org. I'm Sarah Moyer, and we'll be back with more here on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. This is Agriculture Today. Dairy markets have been characterized by broad economic cycles in which prices will rise for a year or two, peak, then decline, sometimes sharply, for a multi-year period before recovering again. Milk prices and producer margins have been low since the record levels of 2014. Prices took a steep dive in 2015 and fell further in 2016. 2017 represented somewhat of a recovery, but only a modest one as margins for dairy producers have remained fairly weak. K-State dairy specialist Mike Brook says that those tight margins are likely to continue. Mike, an opportunity to find out a little bit about the dairy industry, and I'm kind of wondering, the state of the dairy industry, if you had to look at it nationally and in Kansas, where do we stand right now? We know that everything is tight margin-wise. I guess it depends on which factor of the dairy industry we want to look at. There's lots of different ways we can look at that. If we look at it strictly in terms of cow numbers and milk production across the United States, we continue to grow a little bit each year, both in cow numbers and in in milk production. And I think for the year right now, we're still uh, up just about 2%. So as you look at how does that relate to an industry that's really having an issue with margins right now as we are in the dairy industry, why do you still see an increase in cow numbers and why do you see milk production going up? One of the things that uh, drives that is the fact that our producers are actually very good and uh, 
everybody that's in the business is striving to do better. And as they do that, they look at other ways that they can, you know, increase the uh, production on their farm, whether that be production per cow or whether it be adding a few more cows to the operation. And that's really kind of what drives the increase in cow numbers in, in the milk production is people just really trying to react with what's going on with margin and still trying to keep cash flow up on their dairy. Now, uh, that probably means that we will see some dairies exit from the business, and we're starting to see that, actually. We're pretty stable here in Kansas and uh, have been uh, for actually quite some time in terms of total number of cows. Uh, we add about five to 6,000 cows a year on average, if you look back uh, the last 10 years or so. I think we're sitting at about 156,000 dairy cows here in the state today. And I expect that number to continue to grow a little bit uh, each year. Uh, and we've got um, existing operations that uh, continue to expand. Our actual numbers of dairy farms has actually been fairly stable uh, the last three, four years. Uh, we've hovered right around 300 dairies. I think we're just a little under that uh, today. I do think that we will see a drop off in that number as we move forward through the next two to three years. But I think we'll actually grow cow numbers in the state and total milk production. Consumer-wise, I guess what it boils down to is demand, and then we also have our input costs. So when the prices are low, that's when things get tough. Right. And, you know, from a consumer standpoint, uh, everybody enjoys probably going to the store and and purchasing milk for less than $2 a gallon. And uh, we've been, if you think about it, we've been able to uh, do that uh, for quite some time now, actually. So uh, that's an indication that uh, life probably isn't so good uh, on the dairy farm. I mean, Right now, feed costs are fairly low due to the fact that grain markets are depressed for the most part. So that does help us a little bit on the margin thing. But uh, it's really been, for the dairymen, it's been really tough because we've seen uh, our price for milk has varied tremendously in the last six years. And we've gone from very good to very bad. And we're in, you know, we've been through that cycle now about two and a half times in the last six years. So uh, it, and the upside has not been quite long enough for us totally to recover from the downside. So that adds to the pressure that we see on the dairy farm as well. I know you go out. I know you make a lot of visits. What are the producers asking you? What are they trying to figure out in, in terms of how they can make their operation more profitable? That's a good question. I think it depends on maybe where I'm at in the state or actually in the United States. So as we look at the cost of dairy production, uh, feed costs is a huge part of that. So anything we can do to shave on feed cost is generally in our best interest. And for most of our producers, particularly here in Kansas, we raise all of our own forages. So uh, focusing on forage quality and doing a better job with the forages and feeds that we raise on the farm to make them uh, more nutritious uh, for the dairy cows so we can get a lot more nutrition out of the forages and less that we have to actually purchase off the farm is a real benefit to the margin on a dairy farm. And uh, so we've seen the amount of forages that we actually feed in, in dairy cattle rations actually go up fairly significantly on um, a lot of our farms. And we tend to uh, today probably versus 10 years ago, we're feeding a lot more corn silage, which is a crop that here in Kansas we can raise with uh, consistency and actually get really good quality as well. So on the feeding side, that's probably been one of the biggest changes we've actually seen is that we just feed a higher level of forage and a higher percentage of that forage is actually corn silage today. And I know one of the things you talk about on the milk lines often is harvesting at the right time and making sure that the moisture is at a good content. Right. For silage, that's a, a real critical factor. If we're talking silage or we're talking uh, high moisture grains that we ferment uh, in a silo. So uh, getting those right is really important. This year has been a little bit of a challenge in part of our state just because of the dry weather that we've had. And now, we, well, now we're, we're kind of in a period where we've had a lot of rain in areas that weren't quite done with uh, some of their uh, silage harvest, particularly for later planted uh, crops. So we've had some delay in harvesting some of that. So Some of that's going to come out of the field actually a little drier than what uh, we would like and could uh, present us with some uh, 
production problems as we go uh, through uh, 2019. So just have to wait and see what they actually get put up. Pregnancy rate is another thing that you talk about a lot? Yeah. So uh, one of the things that uh, as we look at profitability on a dairy, it's a continuum because we take cows from one lactation to the next. And pregnancy rate is just a way that uh, we can measure the performance of our, our breeding herd and just our breeding herd animals that we're actively trying to inseminate and get pregnant. And when we look at that number, we find that if we do a better job, and that number, uh, actually there's about three factors that go into that. One of the most important factors is at what point in her lactation does she become eligible to be inseminated. We can start too early. We can also start too late. So that's an important factor that controls whether or not she's actually in the breeding herd. And once she's in the breeding herd, then we do have to think about what's the chance that she'll actually be detected or we'll, we'll actually see her in heat and we'll actually inseminate her. That's where a lot of times our hormone programs become important as we look at uh, ways that we regulate uh, the estrus cycles uh, in dairy cows so we actually do detect them in heat and get them inseminated. And then finally is, you know, if we inseminated her, did she actually become pregnant? So what is the conception rate? So those three things really have a huge impact on whether or not we're getting the right cows inseminated and uh, whether or not we're actually those animals that are inseminated are they actually becoming pregnant. And that's how we increase our pregnancy rate. When pregnancy rates go up, we'd like to uh, well, we used to say we'd like to be in the mid-20s on pregnancy rate. Today, we're probably looking to the high 20s to maybe even 30% is really what we're looking for in an ideal situation in a herd where we're really getting, getting animals uh, pregnant and ready for the next lactation. And is this also a good time to take a look at the size of your herd and make sure it's where it needs to be? Sure. Probably one of the critical things coming out of summer to really consider is do we have open cows in the herd that it's really time for them to, to go on to the next career. So taking a look, really hard look at the animals that you have in your herd that are, say, more than 180 days in milk and uh, they're still open, uh, not pregnant. Uh, those are animals probably that uh, you might want to think about whether or not you actually are going to try to inseminate them again or not or do they go on the call list. And right now uh, in our industry, we've got a huge supply of heifers. So uh, we got, it's not like we don't have uh, replacement animals out there available to us. And, and as you look down the road, it might be more profitable to replace that open animal that's going to be hitting 200, 220 days in milk. And uh, she's going to be on the downside of her curve. And if she's still open, that's a problem for us versus a heifer that can come in and, you know, consistently produce 80 to 90 pounds of milk for us. I know you don't have a crystal ball, but do things look good moving forward? Well, I guess as farmers, we're always optimists. So it's always going to be better tomorrow than it is today. Um, but no, looking, looking forward, uh, I think all indications or most indications right now are it's going to remain fairly tight uh, and uh, maybe through uh, all of 2019. I don't, I don't have a crystal ball, so anything can happen. Obviously, some of the things that are going on uh, with trade uh, worldwide, if, you know, if we continue to, to milk a few more cows in this country and produce uh, more milk, we need to be able to export that milk. Or, or the products that come from that milk. And that, that's really critical because we probably aren't going to drive consumption forward enough in this country to accommodate the uh, extra milk that's coming on the market. So if we don't find an export market for those products, uh, that's a serious situation for our industry actually here in the States. That's K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook with an overview of the challenges facing the dairy industry. This is the K-State Radio Network. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants.
Welcome back to Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. In today's agricultural news, Kansas State University's Animal Sciences and Industries Family and Friends Reunion is set for October 12th, and the deadline to get registered for the event is September 28th. Family and Friends Reunion Coordinator Patsy Houghton and Animal Sciences and Industry Communications Coordinator Angie Denton recently sat down with Sarah Moyer to preview the event. Patsy, who serves on the Livestock and Meat Industry Council Board, says that a number of years ago the board developed a new award with the ASI department. Department, known as the Don L. Good Impact Award, to recognize industry game changers. However, the one challenge they had was providing a venue to present the award to the winners. So we decided to think outside the box and develop our own venue, and we thought something that might be a lot of fun and could help reconnect and renew friendships and connections within the Animal Science Department would be to develop a reunion. So we went down the road of developing this big annual event that's held on the Friday evening prior to the first home football game in October every year. This will be our fourth run at it. Last year, we had an attendance of just over 1,250 people. We're targeting a few more this year. We'll see how that turns out. It's been very well attended, and it gives us an opportunity to reconnect and renew friendships as well as recognize industry game changers. Once again, the event will be held at the Stanley Stout Center. Why does that venue work well for the activities going on? It's just absolutely the perfect venue for this event. It's near campus but off campus, so we don't have parking issues. We've got plenty of room to park as many people as want to show up. You'll probably be met by students on horseback to help you park, and then we can ferry you to the Stout Center with uh, what we call the Purple People Mover, This particular event center is such an all-purpose center that was uh, developed a number of years ago with behind the lead donation from Rich Porter, another member of our LMIC council, and it just really lends itself to what we're trying to do. Some of the activities include food, of course, live music, a junior wildcat barnyard, and some special musical appearances from the KSU marching band. Will you tell us more about those exciting attributes of the event. Justin Jansen, who is on the LMIC board, and he does a fantastic job coming up with ideas to keep those kids busy while their parents and grandparents are visiting with others. Junior barnyard kids can compete to qualify to attend the State Fair Pedal Tractor Pull, as well as we have all the kids sign their intent to attend K-State whatever year they're um, eligible here, and then they're put in a drawing for some great prizes. We have all four meats uh, from beef to pork to chicken to lamb available, and our our food is kind of one of those highlights of the evening. We also have uh, Rusty Ryerson, an ASI graduate. Um, He will be playing, and then, of course, the K-State Marching Band and the Wildcat Walk where our guests come back into the Stout Center for the awards ceremony. And who is the award recipient this year? The award recipient is Cattlefax. Cattlefax is a marketing information center based out of Denver, Colorado, but their history is right here in the state of Kansas with the Kansas Livestock Association. The original offices for Cattlefax were on the edge of the KLA offices. There's a tremendous connection with the state and also with Kansas State University and the Kansas Livestock Association. Cattlefax has made a big difference for cattlemen throughout the United States for a lot of years at this point in time, and they truly have been a game changer from the standpoint of a data collection center and dissemination of information so that livestock producers can better market their livestock. You hope to have convinced some people by now with all the activities going on, the special award, and people coming to attend that they may want to reconnect with. What's the next step? Where should they be looking for registration information? They can go to the animal science website, asi.ksu.edu slash family and friends. The registration form is there. It's also linked off the main web page if you don't want to drive on into the website. But pre-registration deadline is September 28th. $25 for adults, kids 12 and under are free. And then the cost in between there for students 13 and over between that 13 and 18 age range, they are a discounted price of $10 before the early registration deadline that's next week. Some final thoughts, Patsy. What's the reason that this event has become an annual event and why do people continue to enjoy to come? Well, it's just a great time, and you have the opportunity to rub elbows with some of the best protein producers in the United States that Kansas State University has been responsible for building. 
You know, at Kansas State University, we talk about family a lot, and you'll notice that the name of the event is Family and Friends rather than Friends and Family. And it's because at Kansas State University, family always comes first. That, along with the uniqueness of the Junior Wildcat Barnyard attraction, uh, we've heard many times over the last four years, we talk a lot about family at Kansas State University, but this event really embodies what it is we're trying to do with the meaning of family and including these little ones and bringing them along as little people and introducing them to Kansas State University at this level is really, really unique and very, very effective. Well, thank you both. Patsy and Angie for coming on and sharing today about the event. Once again, the details to remember are that registration deadline, that's September 28th, and the event itself, once again, October 12th. And again, for more information or to register, visit asi.ksu.edu slash family and friends. In other agricultural news, youth from 93 counties have entered more than 2,000 animals in the 86th Kansas Junior Livestock Show. Todd Domer with the Kansas Livestock Association breaks down those numbers for the individual shows and previews the event. A total of 806 exhibitors plan to bring 125 market steers, 363 breeding heifers, 245 market hogs, 313 breeding gilts, 308 market lambs, 294 breeding ewes, 203 market goats, and 175 commercial doe kids to the show. The statewide event will take place October 5th through the 7th at the Kansas State Fairgrounds in Hutchinson. The show will award cash to exhibitors of the top five animals in both market and breeding shows for all four species. Separate from the selection of species champions, a showmanship contest will be held. The Junior Livestock Show will present a number of scholarships during the show to exhibitors who have excelled academically, in community service, and in 4-H and FFA. This is the 26th year for the scholarship program, which has awarded a total of $431,000 to 313 Kansas Junior Livestock Show exhibitors since 1993. The Kansas Livestock Foundation will sponsor a club calf show and sale in conjunction with the Junior Livestock Show. Steer and heifer prospects will sell October 6th, with the commission proceeds going toward the Foundation's Youth in Agriculture Scholarships. The Kansas Livestock Association, Kansas State University, and the Agribusiness Council of Wichita serve as the three major sponsors of the show. I'm Todd Domer. And that's a look at today's agricultural news. This is the K-State Radio Network. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. I'm Randall Kowalik. We're getting into the part of the year where it's going to be the perfect time for planting fall trees and shrubs in the home landscape. Joining us is Cheryl Boyer, a K-State Research and Extension horticulturist, uh, associate professor of of horticulture at Kansas State University. What do you notice that is new and emerging in in all of this, uh, first of all, this year? Because you work with a lot of the the commercial folks as well. I do. So I work with nursery crop production and landscape establishment, trying to help people have successful yards. And there have been quite a few studies that publish on when plants survive and when they do the best in the landscape based on what time of year you plant them. And overall, fall planting just edges out just about any other season for planting. And that's because the soil is still warm and the plants are heading into dormancy, so they're not actively growing. And you can get it in the ground for the roots to establish before things get really, really cold for the winter. There are a lot of considerations to be made. First of all, how much light is this area of the yard getting? Uh, What's the soil condition like in this part of the yard? But what are some of the key things besides that that homeowners need to focus on? 
you can think about plant selection um, in terms of production type, but once you've identified what type of plant you want, what type of tree, and we do have an entire shade tree publication available in the bookstore as well, and also a website with pictures. It's called kansasroots.org, and it's got lots of all of our recommended plants on it. And the key for that is that most of the state of Kansas, there are exceptions, I will allow that. But for the most part, we have really high pH soils, and that means they're alkaline. So you want to look for terms like pH adaptable or alkaline tolerant. Um, If you get something that likes acidic soil, which is the low end of the pH spectrum, the plants are going to struggle from the get-go. And this is where buying plants from your local independent garden center is going to help you be more successful because they're much more familiar with what soils are in your particular location, whereas often the big box stores are are buying for a multi-state region. I always get sad when I see people buy a beautiful rhododendron from a big box store that looks amazing in the garden center, and then it completely fails in their landscape. And it's really an issue of pH. And you can, if you are an avid gardener and you want to heavily manipulate your soil to be acidic so you can grow those things, you can. But I always advocate planting things that can just take the situations that we have already here natively. So there's soils, how much you're going to be able to water it, how much water the plant itself likes, and taking into consideration what type of plant you're getting in terms of production. So as the nursery production specialist, I have a lot of experience with um, how plants are grown. And so it's important to know just some pros and cons on buying trees and shrubs in containers versus bald and burlap versus bare root. So in containers, you have 100% of that root system, but it generally has very poor structure. There are some very nice, fancy root pruning pots that some growers use, but they're expensive. So most of the time, you're going to see a smooth-sided container, and those roots will hit the edge of that container and start turning and turning and turning and turning. And until you are ready to plant them and cut them and say, hey, I've prepared a planting hole for you so you can go out and explore, they're going to continue to circle, even if you've planted them into the landscape. So the latest research on that is depending on the size of the container, shave off or take your knife or your shovel and shave off those circling roots on the outside and the bottom of the container. It's really important for trees so you don't have girdling roots that can sort of strangle the tree and cause it to be weak. Perennials and shrubs, it's less important, but it will encourage better establishment. In a container, if it, it fertilization is and watering is really important during production because that's their whole world. That's where they get all of their resources from. So hopefully that's been managed well, but if it hasn't, then that's just something to be aware of. Now, the other thing that you'll see most commonly, and I have seen this almost exclusively, there, there are some exceptions, but in really large trees is this bald and burlap type production. And the difference, aside from size, because really you can get much larger trees, bald and burlap, is that when they harvest that tree with a tree spade in the field, they they cut the root system. So some growers will come in on a regular basis, you know, every one or two years and sort of pre-dig the tree and put it back in the hole so that the fine roots will proliferate there in that root ball right next to the trunk. But sometimes they don't. And generally when you harvest a bald and burlap tree, you're only getting about 10 to 15% of the root ball. So, but the structure is really, really good. And bald and burlap trees establish just fine around here. It's just something to be aware of. So bald and burlap trees are, they were growing in the ground. So they're harvested when they're dormant, usually in the very early spring. And you want to get them planted pretty quickly so that they have time for those roots to establish and, and be happy in their new home before the tree tries to put on a bunch of growth. So those types of trees are very rarely harvested in the summer because the tree is actively growing and we don't want to interrupt that. So that's why planting those big trees in the dormant time of the year is, or when you're headed into dormancy is a a good option. (laughs) Well, that is interesting. So those are the different things we can look for as as trees. And, And on a final note, unlike choosing a variety of tomato, for example, It doesn't work this year. Eh, no big deal. We'll try something next year. Those things are constantly changing. Your annuals in the flower beds, those are constantly changing. But these perennial trees and shrubs, 
these are the things that you're going to plan today and possibly 30 years from now, your grandkids are going to see them if you take good care of them. So because of that, take a little bit of extra time to plan and, and, and make a good decision on these things. That's right. I think a lot of people sometimes delay choosing a tree because they think, oh, well, I'm not going to be here to enjoy it or that's not going to grow fast enough. Well, if you plant a tree that grows really fast, they're very often weak wooded and they're not quality trees that you'll probably have to take out before that 30 year or 100 year time frame happens. So, yeah, I mean, it is a big investment. It's something that's going to be around for a long, long time. And you have to be patient. But I think most people will find that trees grow a lot faster than you think they do. And before you know it, you're going to see all these um, family pictures. And suddenly that little tiny tree that you planted in the back is, you know, 60 feet tall. And how did that happen? So yeah, it's really important to think about the future and think about what you want for your space and how you're going to get there and, and be patient and you'll be rewarded pretty quickly. Cheryl, thanks for joining us. K-State Research and Extension horticulturist Cheryl Boyer discussing fall planting of trees and shrubs. Now, you can find bonus content from this interview online. Just visit our podcast site at agtoday.net, as well as the K-State Research and Extension Twitter feed. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.